first clue lay hidden in the Apennine Hills of central Italy. From the days of the very first dinosaur to the last, this whole rocky landscape was mud at the bottom of the sea. In the early 1890s, a wandering geologist noticed a discrete band of black organic rich shale sandwiched between the otherwise normal limestone. This one metre of black shale was little more than a curiosity and it might have remained just that were it not for one very important factor and that is the discovery in the Pacific Ocean in the early 1970s of black shales just like this one of identical age. So all at once people began to realise that this was not a local phenomenon but it was a global phenomenon. It was a revelation. Up until this point, geologists had explained oil source rocks only in terms of specific local conditions, say a particularly fertile stretch of coastline or a naturally stagnant patch of sea floor. But here was evidence of something much bigger going on. Something big enough to suck the oxygen from oceans right around the planet. It's now thought that the world's richest source rocks and the most prolific oil regions are largely the result of these episodes of near global ocean stagnation, the so-called oceanic anoxic events. And there was another clue hidden in the rocks, the full implications of which are only now being teased out. Each oceanic anoxic event was linked to a super greenhouse world. Now we know that the whole of them, the Jurassic and the Cretaceous, was a warm greenhouse period, but there seem to have been periods or intervals of unusual warmth within that background greenhouse, if you like, to which these events correspond in time. What we find out is that those intervals of time are these super greenhouse climates and they were very different worlds. They were ice-free worlds and we seem to have good supporting evidence for high atmospheric CO2 levels as well. If you look at these times, these oceanic anoxic events, they seem to correlate with intervals of excess volcanism. And these huge outpourings of lava would have vented sulfur dioxide and carbon dioxide, and of course the latter would have promoted global warming. The lead up to every super greenhouse and matching oceanic anoxic event was the same. So the critical question for us becomes how much carbon dioxide does it take to trigger such dramatic changes? That answer can be found in the ancient plants and their descendants still found growing today, like the amazing ginkgo. Here we have a ginkgo plant. These essentially evolved about 200 million years ago. And we can see they have a very distinctive leaf shape. And essentially these probably formed a major component of the diet of dinosaurs through the Cretaceous and Jurassic. If you compare one of these modern leaves with a fossil ginkgo leaf, they're almost identically the same. And so by looking at the structure of this leaf and the chemistry of it and the fossil leaves, we can actually more accurately reconstruct the environment and climate at that time. Living ginkgo plants can be grown under both modern and prehistoric conditions. Like all plants, they take in CO2 through microscopic pores in their leaves. The more carbon dioxide in the air, the fewer pores the leaves need. Thank you, Holly. Comparing pore numbers between living and fossil leaves gives a measure of how much CO2 was swirling through the ancient forests. We find out, based on these plant fossils, that CO2 levels were about four to five times greater than they are today.
four or five times more CO2 than our pre-industrial levels gave you seas so warm you could swim at the South Pole. But don't think of the planet during a super greenhouse as one big tropical paradise. This was a world dangerously out of kilter. As temperatures go up, so does the rate of evaporation and the humidity. The obvious result was more rain, falling heavily in powerful tropical storms. when it came would have been more acidic than today, burning vegetation and etching into the rocks and soils. This probably explains the sudden flood of plant food into the ocean. So huge amount of warming, huge amount of evaporation, lots of clouds, lots of rainfall, swollen rivers wending their way down into the ocean, bringing sediment, but also bringing nutrients like nitrate and phosphate, the sort of things you'd pour on your pot plant to make it grow in a more sort of spectacular way. These also fertilize the ocean and they encourage the plankton and they encourage particular types of plankton, particularly organic wall plankton and bacteria that go to make up our black shales that become our potential petroleum source rocks. Such a flood of nutrients and the plankton blooms are triggered might have been enough to begin an anoxic event on its own. But in a super greenhouse, the overheated oceans were already primed for stagnation. Today's well-ventilated oceans rely on the planet having ice at the poles. It's here that warm, salty water flowing up from the tropics cools down, takes on oxygen, and sinks back into the depths to begin the return journey. This is the engine that drives ocean circulation. The ocean mixes itself on the order of every 500 years or so, and it's that mixing process that brings oxygen into the deep sea. The warming that takes place as a result of the buildup of carbon dioxide um, is, is more um, dramatic at high latitudes. The supply of oxygen depends on there being cold water there. Warm water doesn't hold large amounts of oxygen in it, and so to provide oxygen to the deep sea requires cold waters where these deep waters are sinking. In the lead up to a super greenhouse, there was no cold water at the poles. With both faltering currents and over fertilized surface waters, the stage was set to push large areas of the global ocean, first into runaway anoxia, and then into something far more dangerous. Remove all the oxygen from the water, and deadly poisonous hydrogen sulfide will start to spread upwards from the stagnant depths. There's evidence that during these oceanic anoxic events, you actually had that happening within these broad super oceans. So the whole of the Pacific might have been euxenic, as we call it, devoid of oxygen and containing free hydrogen sulfide. So these very noxious environments spreading over huge areas of the globe. This is what was so special about the major episodes of oil formation. The oceans were dying from a double whammy of suffocation and hydrogen sulfide poisoning. And for as long as sulfur bacteria thrived in the sunlight, many other life forms faced extinction. This was a world with the entire seafloor stagnant and littered with corpses whole coastlines stinking of rotten egg gas and death. But here's the twist. 
Essentially, the system sort of sows the seeds of its own destruction because as you bury the organic matter, essentially you're entombing carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and the ocean, they're always exchanging, is drawn down and the greenhouse effect goes into reverse, the world cools and the oceanic event switches itself off and you're back to equilibrium. And over a time scale, I would say, of maybe a quarter of a million years, something like that, from the switch on point to the switch off point. So the whole thing comes into a beautiful full circle and you can see this anoxic event as a way that the Earth reacts to removing the excess carbon dioxide that's vented into the atmosphere. Of the handful of such events now identified, every one shows the anoxia switch on sharply, as if some threshold of warming is suddenly crossed. And equally suddenly, they switch off when enough carbon has been buried to cool the planet. The burial of excess carbon resets the Earth's thermostat. There is a sharp drop in sea temperature, a drop in sea level, and signs of ice reforming for a time at the poles. And the legacy for us? Another oil deposit entombing all the carbon that caused the problem in the first place. We find the oil, we burn the oil, we push carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere, and essentially we push the planet towards a greenhouse future. Of course, crude oil is only one source of the fossilized carbon we're adding to the atmosphere. If you look at the historical records of the atmospheric CO2, you can see us undulating along in the last ice age, coming out of the last ice age, and then coming up towards the present, and you reach the last century, and it suddenly this spike goes through the roof. And it is probable that the Earth has never experienced a rate of increase of CO2 in the atmosphere at anything like this rate in its history. It's a rate that might be ushering in not just global warming, but the next super greenhouse. The evidence suggests that the overcooked worlds of the past were triggered by levels of CO2 about four times higher than those at the start of our industrial age. But while it took volcanoes thousands or even millions of years to achieve these levels, we're on track to reach them in a hundred. What we're doing is upping the ante by accelerating the rates of natural processes by 100,000, 10,000 times. So we're probably to that extent mimicking a phenomena that have happened in nature, but at this incredibly accelerated time scale. In 2006, southern England sweltered under record-breaking July temperatures. It might have been the first flush of a Jurassic climate returning to the Jurassic coast. Meanwhile, carbon dioxide levels continue to rise, heading for twice pre-industrial levels by the middle of the century. Around the world, the signs of change are making themselves apparent. No one knows at what point we might cross a threshold that switches us into real climate trouble. The guesstimate the world is banking on is that we can escape catastrophic change if we can stop CO2 concentrations from more than doubling. But this assumes there are no surprise amplifying effects waiting in the wings.
standards clear from warming signals in the Arctic, change can be unexpectedly rapid. Much of Greenland has changed rather dramatically, much more dramatically than any of us would have thought 10 years ago. The icebergs you see behind me are all from uh, Jakob Savin Ispray, Greenland's largest outlet glacier. In about 2000, the glacier began speeding up and is now flowing at about twice the rate it was in the mid-90s, which means it's now putting out something like 50 to 60 cubic kilometers of ice a year, um, which is going to have an obvious impact on sea level rise. It's this sudden loss of polar ice, both from the land and particularly from the sea, that has the potential to amplify warming and nudge us more swiftly into a hothouse future. As temperatures rise, there is less shiny white ice left to reflect heat away, and more dark Arctic Ocean ready to absorb it. The faster the sea warms, of course, the quicker the remaining ice melts. It's the sort of feedback loop that could help flip the switch on ocean circulation and perhaps set the stage for the next major phase of ocean stagnation. Already, scientists report signs that the Gulf Stream has begun to weaken. And in late 2004, part of the current actually shut down for 10 days. We would like to be able to conclude that these types of consequences are, are just buried in the distant geological past, but in fact, at least the early stages of widespread oceanic anoxia is where we're probably heading uh, with fossil fuel burning. In terms of uh, the concern that humans should have for the alteration there of, of the environment that supports us, it's, it's certainly on the time scale of concern. As the human population climbs towards 7 billion and the desire for first world affluence spreads across the globe, we're burning oil as fast as we can pull it out of the ground. Cars and suburbs and roads and that whole model of sprawl, which is based on sort of the bounty of oil, is starting to spread to China and India, where they're actually on this frenzy of road building. You know, so in Shanghai, for example, they don't even allow bicycles anymore in Shanghai, in the city. When the Chinese people start driving cars the way we do, then we'll have long passed the tipping point for, um, you know, for climate change. The thirst for crude is pushing civilization simultaneously towards two perilous futures. In one, the flood of cheap energy we've taken for granted will dry up faster than we can adapt. In the other, our headlong rush to use the last of the resource could plunge us into an unpredictable climate catastrophe. On the face of it, you might expect that running out of this stuff will at least save us from the climate threat. The latest work of the climate scientists on this subject, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, says that we can afford, I use that word in inverted commas, uh, if you make certain assumptions about the amplifying factors, the feedbacks um, in the system, we can afford to put into the atmosphere another 400 billion tonnes of carbon. Well, uh, you know, uh, you just look at what's left in fossil fuel reserves below ground, you've got 700 plus in oil alone if you count the regular oil and just a bit of the easily accessible um, unconventional oil like the Athabasca tar sands then you've got 500 billion in gas and coal forget it it's 3500 billion and counting so we can cook our planet many times over if those assumptions are right Pumped from its hiding place beneath the Arabian desert, our carbon atom is once more playing its part 
in the great drama of life on Earth. Meanwhile, the second half of the Earth's endowment of crude lies underground, waiting for the human race to suck it up. Somewhere ahead, one way or another, the end of the oil age is coming. Our whole civilization has evolved in an era of stable climate, which is probably anomalous in terms of, you know, if you look at it over geological time. Um, so was this our moment in the sun, which is now coming to a close? You know, I mean, that's sort of a pessimistic view, but I think perhaps could be, you know, could be true. Really and truly, uh, you've got to be a flat earther not to see what's going on now and what's being projected by all the scientists studying climate. I mean, if we keep going as we are, we will wreck our economies and wreck our planet um, and really completely decimate ecosystems. Well, I claim that our grandchildren are going to look at us and say, you burned all that oil, all those nice molecules, you just burned it? And we'll have to admit, we just burned it. Oil is a precious thing. Fossilized sunlight captured by tiny brainless organisms that lived for a mere instant in geological time. Yet every year we burn more and more of what we have less and less of. Are we mining the aftermath of past climate catastrophes simply to engineer our own? It would be ironic indeed if the end of our oil age becomes the start of the Earth's next great phase of oil formation. One thing is clear, love it or loathe it, we've all become part of oil's extraordinary story.